Hi everyone, my name is Ioli Scarlet Rose Harper and today I'm going to be telling you about my conversion story and which is basically I will be telling you about the circumstances surrounding my decision to be baptized. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and I was baptized on March 28, 1999. At the time, oh, and I've got a computer right here that I looked down at because I didn't want it to take so long when I talked, so I wrote down everything. So I'm just going to kind of be um, glancing at it to make sure that I don't leave stuff out that I thought was kind of important. Anyway, um, at the time, I lived in White River, Arizona with my mother. I was a student at the White Mountain Apache Tribal education building trades program and I was learning carpentry there were only two women taking the carpentry course at that time I was a Lutheran and most of my family were Lutherans at the time uh, I went to a parochial school from kindergarten to eighth grade and so I had already been taught much about God and throughout my whole life I have always felt really close to God in my very young adulthood, I had problems with depression and anxiety. It started when I was about 18. As many of you know, the two go hand in hand. And for those of you that have had it, you know that it can be unbearably painful. I suffered through much of my young adulthood. At a time when other people are usually having fun and enjoying young adulthood, I was trying to survive. At first, I didn't know what was going on with me. It started off as anxiety attacks, which really got out of control. I did get some medical help about a year later, but it was just some medication that was prescribed by a psychiatrist. And um, I only took it once or twice because I didn't like the way it made me feel. It did stop an attack uh, when it was happening though. And, um, I had had the anxiety problem for so long that it really spiraled my brain chemistry out of control, or at least that's the way it felt, and I was having severe depression. Despite this, I tried to have a normal young adulthood. I just suffered with it, and I didn't really tell anyone about it. I didn't know what was happening to me at first, which is why I didn't get help right away. Um, there were a couple of times later on that I did try medication and there were some medications that helped. I did learn how to deal with it or, you know, find ways to avoid it and try to function. Like I said, for those of you who have experienced it, you know how awful it is, how physically ill you are all the time and how horrifying it can be. It is. I had started the Building Trades program because I wanted a job and I heard that the tribe was willing to pay students to take the program. So I worked on people's houses four days a week and studied in class one day a week. I got paid just under minimum wage for the first four days of work and then on um, Fridays we didn't get paid for work. We had to study. We mostly remodeled elderly people's homes and from top to bottom. I got my anxiety and depression under control well enough um, to get through work each day, though it was really tough. Sometimes I would crash, you know, like um, it just got so bad. And I would get desperate and I would try to go see a doctor. I tried going to see my pastor and having him pray for me. I was willing to get involved in church and started attending Bible classes after church even. However, there was only one pastor and there were a lot of people who probably needed all sorts of help and guidance. One day I was pretty bad off and I went to church to talk to the pastor. His wife came to the door and said in a very unfriendly tone, Oh, you must be here to see my husband. She accentuated the two words, my husband, kind of like that way. Um, I got the message that she was worried I was going to see her husband for um, the wrong reason, perhaps. I decided to brush it off 
because I was really sick and rather desperate and I really wanted someone to pray for me. And the pastor, um, of course, he, he never acted inappropriately or anything like that. And I certainly um, wasn't interested in seeing the pastor for anything other reason than to be prayed for. And I, um, and he did pray for me. There were times when it got so bad that I didn't know if I could live anymore. I didn't ever contemplate suicide, but I did know I couldn't continue to exist this way. I remember being terrified in my room one night and praying to God to please let me know that he was real. I told him that I really needed to know. I made it through probably another two weeks or more, then I hit rock bottom again. I was shaking and terrified for no reason. I was having continuous shocks of overwhelming fear and panic over and over and over again. It had been going on so long that my body was in pain. It had gotten worse. My brain chemicals were really messed up and there was no way out. I was trapped in my own body. And I know there's a lot of you guys that know what that's like. Um, all I knew was fear and pain. I lived in a constant fog. I looked out the window that night and it was really dark. It was probably about 10 or midnight. There was nothing to be scared of outside, but my body didn't know that. I was suffering immensely and the months and years of it had worn me down to almost nothing. At least that's how I felt at that time, at that moment. I looked out the window into the sky and asked God again to please let me know if he was there. I told him rather urgently that I needed to know if he was there. I told him that I didn't know if I could go on like this. I begged him to tell me if he was there or not. I said that if he was, I really needed to know it. And I felt that down inside of me, the need to know for surety was there. Not just a philosophical belief, but real knowledge. I had to know, and the reason I had to know was because if God was real, then I knew that I could be saved from this amount of suffering that I was in. Previous to that, I had seen two young men at the four-way stop in Chinatown. That's what everyone called the subdivision where my mom lived. They had been wearing suits. I recalled that they were white men, a young white men, and one of them was handsome from the quick look that I had gotten when I was driving by. Anyway, I don't, th I didn't think much about it or who they were or where they came from. You know, I was just kind of driving past. I, I saw them again in town a couple of times or in the neighborhood. Anyway, so one day at work, I told the other lady at work that I had seen two white guys in suits in town. She said they were missionaries that they had been trying to visit her house. Anyway, my neighbor that was just right next door was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I didn't know that. Anyway, I knew where the church was, but I never thought about it. And uh, one of my cousins used to meet with the older missionaries and they used to visit her and I had seen them at her house, but I'd never talked to them, and I'd never even thought about talking to them, though I was courteous to them when I went to her house. Anyway, one day my mom said that she was going over to the neighbor's house, and then she came back. My neighbor had invited my mom over to meet the missionaries. I don't think my mom told me, but I soon realized that my mom was going over there to meet with the missionaries. She never invited me to go, and I'm sure my neighbor would have wanted me to come too, but they probably didn't think that I wanted to go because, or, um, because you know, otherwise I would be coming with my mom, uh, you know, over to see the missionaries, but I never went with, and I never went with because uh, my mom never told me to go with her. She never told me that I was invited, so I was always staying at the house. Anyway, I started going outside when my mom would head over to the neighbor's house. I would just be doing something in the yard on purpose. I would sometimes say hi, and the young elders would just wave, and they'd say hi, you know, and then uh, they'd get in their vehicles and leave. 
um, or if they were just arriving, they'd be like, hi, you know, after I said hi, I'd be like, hi, <laughs> and they'd just like, hi, and then they'd, uh, you know, quick wave and then head in the house. Anyway, no one ever introduced me. My mom would happily head over to the neighbor's house because my mom is a social person. She's friendly and she loves people. She loves parties and get togethers. And she's a real sweetheart that way. I figured the meetings were lasting about this certain amount of time. And um, about that time, I would start going looking out the window to see when everyone was leaving. And when it looked like it was over, I would go outside to my car, which was parked right next to uh, my neighbor's house because our driveways were adjacent to each other. And I would pretend like I was getting something out of the truck. Then I would say, hi, and I would politely, or I would, I would pretend like I was getting something out of the trunk of my car. Um, you know, and then I would be digging around in there for however long that I needed to dig in order for the missionaries to walk past me. Then I would say hi, you know, and then they would say hi, you know, and then they would get in their vehicle and leave. <sighs> anyway, I don't know why they probably didn't take time to come over and speak with me. Looking back, you know, um, missionaries aren't supposed to flirt and stuff like that. I was by other people's standards, you know, from what other people told me at that time, I was a nice looking person and, um, you know, I was about their age and I don't, um, I wasn't trying to flirt with them, but I did feel like I wanted to talk to them. And, um, I don't know exactly what the motivation was. I just wanted to make friends and get to know them. I'm not really even sure that I knew what the motivation was, but, um, Anyway, I, I think looking back that it was the Holy Spirit telling me that I should go talk to them. Um, I started noticing that I would see them at everyone else's house knocking on their door. One day I could tell that they were going through my neighborhood and that they were knocking on people's doors and that pretty soon they were going to be at my house, you know, from the looks of it because they were going down that way and, and then the loop kind of came down this way and, and we were over here. And I knew they were going to get there pretty soon. Anyway, so um, by the time, uh, well, no one ever knocked on my door. So I was puzzled as to how they skipped their house. And uh, pretty soon I looked outside and they were down the street. And so then I realized they skipped over my house. Anyway, um, I was puzzled as to how they skipped over my house. And then it dawned on me. They don't think they need to go to my house because the woman who lives at the house, my mom, was already meeting with them. So they skipped over our house and went to a different house. Anyway, uh, so one day at work on our study day, I told my co-worker that I had been doing these things to get the missionaries' attention, such as going outside when they were at my neighbor's house, saying hi, waving in a friendly way you know, etc., etc. these things I was up to. She told me that they had been coming to her house and she visits with them sometimes and is courteous, of course, but she was not really interested in what they had to say. She said she did visit with them a couple of times, but she often told her kids to tell them that she wasn't home. And I figured that was understandable. She was a polite, kind, sweet person, and she just didn't have it in her to tell people that she didn't want to talk to them. She's always been really sweet. Anyway, and I guess that was an easier alternative, you know, at the time. Um, most Lutherans don't use the term saved, mm, but I have heard other religions use that term here and there. So after I told her about all my activities regarding trying to get those missionaries to talk to me, I jokingly said to her, what do they think, that I don't need to be saved or something? Anyway, so we had a really, we had a little laugh about it, and then, um, and then we went back to work, got back to work with what we were up to. Um, well, one day shortly thereafter, I heard a knock on my front door. My cousin and her boyfriend were over, and he was drinking beer at the couch. Um, my mom was there. We were all sitting around visiting. I was up to some little thing that I had going in the living room, rearranging the couches and stuff like that anyway. But um, I opened the door, 
and there were two missionaries standing at my door um, on my front porch, just right there. And I, and they looked super excited. Anyway, they told me that they had heard that there was a girl there that wanted to talk to them. <laughs> and I was so overwhelmingly happy. I was like, yeah, that's me, that's me. Anyway, uh, I invited them into the living room. My mom looked really disappointed that they were there, which I couldn't really figure out because she had been meeting with them at the neighbor's house. And uh, I noticed that my cousin's boyfriend, he like slid his beer behind his foot to try to hide it because, you know, there was holy men coming into the house. And, you know, uh, Padres are really respectful, respectful of holy people, you know, no matter what church they're from. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but I was so excited and happy to see them. It was the best ever. Uh, they introduced themselves and we talked a bit and they made plans to come back over again on a different day. I was so happy. I went to work and I told my coworker about it. Anyway, she said, do you wanna know what happened? And yeah, I was curious, you know, what it, what happened, you know, behind, behind the scenes. Anyway, I mean, I didn't think about it, but she told me that they had, she, she said, they came over to my house the other day and I told my kids to tell them that I'm not home. That's what she said. Uh, my kids told me to go tell them myself and that they aren't gonna lie for me anymore. And she was laughing about it. So she really, she had a really good relationship with her children. They're a lovely family. They're such good people. And I don't blame her for not knowing, you know, what to say to the missionaries to tell them that she wasn't interested, but she came up with a good idea on the spot to kind of uh, send them in a different direction. And so she said that she went to the front door and told them, do you want to know who wants to talk to you? That girl that lives in that house over there. So she pointed out where I lived and she um, told them what color house it was so they can make sure to get to the right spot. And uh, I guess they beelined it straight for my house. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> she really saved my life that day. She doesn't even know how much she did for me by doing that for me, but uh, she really saved my life that day. So the missionaries kept coming over to see me and teach me. I never made the connection at the time to that second prayer that I had said in desperation a week or a week and a half before they showed up at my house. That realization came later as I was looking back, maybe like within a year or something like that. I was in, it was a very happy time for me. My life was filled with light and joy. I made friends with them. I understood that missionaries aren't for dating and I didn't flirt with them and things like that. But I had made very good friends. The first elders to visit me were Elder Green and Elder Chug. Elder is an office in the priesthood for those of you that don't know. Then Elder Green was transferred to a different area, I think about two weeks later or something like that. And um, his replacement was Elder MacArthur. I didn't get to know Elder Green very well because I only saw him a couple of times. However, I felt like Elder Chug, who I got to know very well, um, was one of the most kind and tender-hearted people I had ever met. He made an impression on me because he was such a good, kind person. I didn't know that people could be that kind and that sweet and that good. Um, he was humble. We shared so much in common personality-wise, and he was so very helpful in teaching me about the church. Our, all our visits were centered around God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the gospel. I always valued people who are, who are kind and unassuming, and he didn't have a prideful bone in his body. Um, I, don't, I didn't understand how anyone could be so kind and so good. It was a revelation to me to meet men who were so wholesome and so devoted to God. They were young and yet they put God first. He used to bring me neat spiritual stories every few days that he had found which he thought would touch my heart and they did. Um, I'd say, you know, Elder Chug, he really made a big difference for me when I was learning the gospel. I had, 
I was completely in awe of the kind of person he was. And um, I think he taught me more by his example than he ever could have done with his words. And it was one of the main things that made me look at the church and decide that this is where I want to be and decide that this is what I wanted to look into more. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and, and he taught me um, the things that God wanted me to know. And because of his goodness and his willingness to follow God, he brought me out of a very dark place in my life and showed me the light of God. And because of that, I have been so very, very blessed in this life. Elder MacArthur was such a cool person as well. He had been to college for a while. Um, he said that he was, uh, he served his mission right before the age limit. Um, there's like an age limit for missionaries to serve and he served his mission right before that age limit. So he'd already had some experience in the world, you know, um, and he had been in college for a while and it said at first he wasn't ready to serve a mission, but he eventually decided to set his worldly cares aside and serve God. And he had a girlfriend waiting for him at home. I remember thinking that I could relate to him because, um, you know, he, he wasn't really doing anything bad, but, but it took him some time, he said, to decide that a mission was the way he wanted to go. And I had been living a life that was not always in line with God's teachings. And it was good to have someone who knew and understood the world and was a living example of God's forgiveness. And, you know, um, and of making the choice to put God first in all things, despite, um, you know, what you may have chosen in the past. I felt like it was a good combination to have these two teach me. I am sure that God set it up that way for me. It was a marvelous experience. It was so wonderful. I was so happy and I looked forward to them coming to visit again as soon as they left the house. The elders would always ask me to read certain scriptures in the Book of Mormon. I almost always didn't have them read by the time they got there and they often had a disappointed look on their face for a second or two, but I didn't feel the need to read them all at that time. And anyway, we would go over the scripture when they got there and talk about what it meant. I was an eager student though. I listened and learned everything that they, wa that, uh, they wanted to teach me. I noticed after a couple of weeks that my depression, anxiety, and any other symptoms would be gone for about a couple of hours after they left. I never knew when it started, but I could tell when it stopped. Eventually, about two hours after they left, I would start feeling the depression creep back in on me again. One time, I even decided to try to figure out when the awful depression stopped after they arrived at the house, but I never managed to figure out exactly uh, when that happened. But I knew when the depression came back. So while they were there and for about two hours after they left, I would feel good. I would feel normal again without any symptoms of anxiety or depression. So I did put two and two together and uh, I had them over to the house as soon as possible. Literally, that was the only time that I ever had a break from the depression and anxiety. Uh, and you know, for that period of time while they were there until about two hours after, I felt happy, I felt good, I felt whole. I, I did have some people, such as my mother and her pastor, that tried to dissuade me to, to visit um, from visiting the missionaries, but I was never one to worry about what other people thought of me. I'm sure my mom was just showing motherly concern because some people did tell lies about the church to her. There was a lot of things that were told to her at that time that, you know, I found out were not correct. And um, she was just worried about me. 
I suppose I would never have done a, some of the good things in, I have done in my life if I was the type to worry about what other people thought of me. My mother um, and I had, you know, some mm, disagreements about it over time, but over time she became very accepting of me uh, going to church and um, she has always been very proud of me and supportive of me. She's a really good mom. I did eventually glance at the scriptures the missionaries asked me to read, and like I said, we often went over them while they were teaching, but we did not read all of the passages while they were there. I want They wanted me to read them so that I could know that the Book of Mormon was true for myself, and so I could have my own knowledge that what I was being taught was the truth. But I knew that what they were teaching me was true. The Holy Spirit told me, I felt it in every fiber of my being. I was filled with light. That feeling that dispelled the darkness in my life wasn't from the missionaries themselves. It was the Holy Spirit filling me with happiness. He testified to me that what the missionaries were saying was true. It gave me the courage to change and to take on a completely new way of life. I have been happy, I have been blessed, and I have had protection as I have followed God's commandments and done His will. He has even protected me and helped me to heal from the mistakes I've made. And as a member of the church, you know, we're, we're taught a lot about what we can do to help ourselves keep the commandments and uh, live a good life. I have not been perfect. I've not been perfect at it. There are mistakes that I've made since I've been a member of the church. And there have been times that I've had to repent for the things that I've done. I can tell you that those times um, haven't been easy. But repentance is worth it. It makes you feel better about yourself. And it makes you feel um, connected to God. And it brings light back into your life. I was baptized by Elder William Nicholas Chug and confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by Elder Aaron James MacArthur. I have always been so very grateful to God for answering my prayers and telling me that he is real. About 10 years later, I was talking to a man who had been a missionary in that area during that time. He was telling me that the mission president, who is in charge of the local area of missionaries, had made an announcement one day to the missionaries that they were going to open the mission area to include the reservation. He had told the elders that he had prayed about it and had an unmistakable feeling from God that this is what he was supposed to do. The elder who was telling me about it told me that the missionaries hadn't been going to the reservation previous to Elder Green and Elder Chug showing up on my reservation. He said that they were the first ones that had been sent back in a long time. I didn't know that until after a decade after I had first met them and been baptized. Then the realization hit me. God heard me. He sent them to go find me because I had asked for them. And the realization also that after all this time, he wanted me to know it. He had told the mission president to open up the mission area to go find me. I would have never known that if I hadn't chanced upon the conversation with that elder so many years later. I knew that God sent the missionaries for me. But he wanted me to know that he did hear me and that he had opened up the mission so that they could find me and rescue me. He cares about the one. At that time, the one was me. I have thought since then that maybe others were asking as well. But I know for sure that whether there were other people asking or not, God sent the missionaries to find me. Testimony means something that has happened to you personally that you know because you experienced it. It is my testimony to you that God is real. He will find you no matter where you are. You could be at the ends of the universe and he will find you. He will still send someone 
to get you if that's how he chooses to do it. He will rescue you. I know that God can do all things himself. He does not need our help to do things because he is omnipotent, which means all-powerful, but he lets us help each other. He sent Elder Chuck and Elder Green to find me, and it changed my life. It brought me out of darkness and despair into the light. My life has really been so much better. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you guys found something helpful in the things that I had to say. I um, never really told very many people this story that aren't members of my church. So for those of you guys that never heard it, uh, there it is. That's why I became a member of the church. Those were all the circumstances surrounding me becoming a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I can honestly say that it is one of the best decisions that I ever made for myself. It really has brought my life up and it really has brought so much happiness. The Lord has blessed me and through his atonement, I have been able to heal from so many things. I no longer have the problems with anxiety and depression that I had when I was young. And I feel pretty good. Um, I'm really healthy. And I hope you guys found something that is helpful in here. And um, thanks for watching. Bye.